Um, so, hi, my name is uh, Mike Bernstein, and this uh, is a talk um, that I wrote for this conference called The Perfect Programming Language. Um, I'm very excited to be here giving the opening talk of CodeConf 2016. I've been a part of the GitHub and open source community for a long time, and uh, when GitHub started putting these conferences together, I always hoped that I would have an opportunity to speak at one, and here I am, and I'm in fabulous Los Angeles, which is a city that I love, and uh, even though as a born and bred uh, New Yorker, I was raised to uh, distrust Los Angeles, but that's okay, I got over that. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm super stoked to be here. Thanks for everyone for having me, and uh, for you know to all of you for, for coming. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, um, I work for a company called Code Climate. Uh, we're a hosted static analysis platform that's dedicated to making it easier for teams to write high quality software together. Ask me for more information at the conference if you uh, see me and uh, if that sounds interesting to you, I'd love to talk your ear off about it. Um, something that I spent a lot of time thinking about. Uh, like Chris mentioned, I also recently finished co-authoring a book about making pizza at home. Uh, it's at the printers right now. You should buy it. It's going to be shipping in a couple weeks and it'll change your life. Um, and I'm an amateur uh, ceramicist and potter. I make um, stoneware pottery uh, at a studio in, in Northeast Washington, D.C., near where I live. It's one of my favorite uh, pastimes. And this is a couple pictures of that stuff. So all of this is to say, I'm clearly eminently qualified to be addressing you about the perfect programming language. Um, and so, uh, so here's, here's the story. I'm going to start the story now. Uh, we don't really have a lot of time, and I've really been looking forward to telling this to you, so let's get started. Uh, it, this story begins, as a lot of my stories do, with me digging through a pile of junk, um, because I spent a lot of time digging through piles of junk. If there was like a fourth thing on this slide up here, it would be just like a pile of junk, but that doesn't photograph very well. Um, so I'm just going to tell you about it. Uh, and, and anyway, one day I was digging through a pile of junk, and I found one of my favorite things to find when I'm digging through a pile of junk, and that's a box of records. I'm a record collector in addition to all of the other um, weird interests of mine. Uh, and, um, and, and inside that box of records was something that I did not expect to find. It was a notebook. And inside that notebook were things that I really uh, three reallys really, really, really didn't expect to find. Um, not to mention that in this box of records was not a normal box of records by any means. When you're used to digging through junk like I am, um, a normal box of records that you find is usually terrible and mostly composed of very old, unplayable classical albums. Um, but this particular box that I found on this fateful day uh, included, in addition to a lot of other uh, very high quality jazz albums, one of my favorite records of all time. Look, this looks fabulous on this big screen. Uh, this Beauty, a 1968 ESP disc issue of Sun Ra's Heliocentric Worlds of Sun Ra, Volume 1. Uh, and on the back cover there, you can see a reproduction of the original cover of the original 1965 issue of the album, but that's a story for a different time. But I'm really excited to be showing this to you on a giant screen here. Um, so, so that's a little bit of an aside, back to the notebook. In a lot of ways, this notebook was an ordinary notebook, uh, one of those like marble cover jobs like I used to use in middle school. And, um, but as soon as I started to look a little bit more closely at it, uh, I knew it wasn't a typical notebook um, uh, because I pulled it out and this is what it said on the cover. It, it read in neat handwriting, the perfect programming language by J. Piano. So you can imagine my astonishment here. Uh, as someone who is both into Sun Ra and programming languages, it seemed beyond unbelievable that there was someone else in the world who was interested in both. Um, and I felt I had found a kindred spirit in this mysterious J piano. So I opened the notebook up and read this curious dedication, which was written in a language I didn't recognize at first. Uh, so I pasted into Google Translate. I don't know how to really read this. I think it says, Dedikita al Borges Sanra Kaj McCarthy. And so I pasted it into Google Translate and it came back with this. It was apparently a dedication written in Esperanto um, to Borges, Sanra, and McCarthy, three of my favorite people from history. Uh, and this was starting to get like a little weird. Um, and so since not everyone will know who these folks are, these three people who uh, the dedication was dedicated to, I'm just going to give you like a little tiny bite-sized introduction to each of these people. 
So Sun Ra, whose record I also found in that box, is one of the greatest jazz composers and performers of all time. Was. He's not around anymore. Um, he was unfathomably prolific and original, uncompromising, and literally not of this world. Um, the man who would become to be known as Sun Ra was born as, born as Herman Poole Blunt in Alabama in 1914. This is a photo of him about 50 years after that. And one of the greatest Sun Ra stories tells of his first visit to Egypt in 1971. As you might tell by his name, Sun Ra, he was really into Egyptian mythology. Uh, and his band, called the Orchestra, wanted to travel to Egypt to play concerts in front of the Great Pyramids. And at the border, uh, when he was asked for his passport, he allegedly handed the Egyptian Border Patrol a passport which purported that his birthplace was Saturn. Like, the, not Saturn, Alabama, like the planet Saturn. So needless to say, he projected an air of alienness authentic enough that he did in fact get admitted into Egypt, uh, and his band was able to perform some legendary concerts there. I guess if someone hands you a passport and says they're from Saturn, you just say okay. Uh, at least in 1971, things have probably changed a little bit since then. Um, and interestingly, the album that I showed you in that box before was released on a label called ESP Disc. Um, and the ESP and ESP Disc doesn't stand for extrasensory perception, it stands for Esperanto, as in the artificial language. So I was like starting to make some connections between these records and this weird dedication. And so here's a shot of the cover of the first record that Bernard Stolman, ESP's proprietor, released on the label. It's called Ni Cantu in Esperanto, which means let's sing in Esperanto. And as you'll see in a bit, this information is only slightly tangential to my story. So the second dedication in the notebook was to uh, Borges. Um, Borges was an Argentine writer, philosopher, poet, and thinker who, similarly to Sun Ra, transcended categorization in a lot of different ways. He was obsessed with many different subject areas, including language. Um, and, and particularly, um, when I saw Borges' dedication written in Esperanto, being someone who has read a decent amount of Borges in my life, I was uh, reminded of a story that Borges wrote called The Analytical Language of John Wilkins. John Wilkins uh, was a real person, um, but in this story, Borges provides a mostly fictitious overview of Wilkins' philosophical writings about a universal language. Wilkins wrote long tracts regarding very logical, human-designed languages, which were meant to reflect the world in a more realistic way than human languages had up until that point. Um, in the end, Borges is pretty tough on Wilkins and his ilk, uh, other people who are interested in these artificial or constructed languages. He doesn't put much faith in the idea that a language can actually be developed a posteriori and be credible, useful, or interesting. Uh, Bo Borges goes so far as to introduce a fictitious encyclopedia from China to support his point, which he calls the, cel the Celestial Empire of Benevolent Knowledge. And he uses this to point out how absurd the idea is that a human-engineered language could transcend knowledge and community. And in the story, Borges reveals that this encyclopedia um, attempts to divide all animals in the universe into these 14 categories. Uh, belonging to the emperor, embalmed, tame, suckling pigs, sirens, fabulous, stray dogs, included in the present classification, frenzied, innumerable, drawn with a very fine camel hair brush, etc. That's my favorite one. Having just broken the water pitcher and those that from a long way off look like flies. Um, so while hilarious, um, it's quite clear that these ambiguities and overlaps uh, in these categories would leave someone who's seeking logic and order, like wanting for a little more, right? Like a dog, right? Like which one are they, right? Are they, they're sort of frenzied, innumerable, and et cetera, for example. I think you get the point. Um, and, and the essay ends with this quote, which is like a, you know, 1950s uh, hot take, um, attributed to Chesterton, and it sums up Borges' view very nicely, so I'm going to read it for you. He knows that there are, in the soul, tints more bewildering, more numberless, and more nameless than the colors of an autumn forest. Yet he seriously believes that these things can, every one of them, in all of their tones and semitones, in all their blends and unions, be accurately represented by an arbitrary system of grunts and squeals. He believes that an ordinary civilized stockbroker can really produce out of his own inside noises which denote all the mysteries of memory and all the agonies of desire. This is um, a rather poetic takedown of the idea that a quote-unquote perfect 
human language could ever really exist. And so finally, uh, the final person in this uh, dedication trio was uh, John McCarthy, you know, that Lisp guy. Um, uh, he was an MIT researcher and mathematician, best known for his involvement in the creation of a programming language known as Lisp. Um, here's one of my favorite pictures of McCarthy. Uh, he's chilling in a lab with some robots. That's the face I make when my daughter asks me if she can watch more television. I don't have the benefit of like cool robots behind me though, so it doesn't always work so well, but sort of an appeal to authority thing, I guess. Um, and here's the bottom half of page 13 of the Lisp 1.5 programmer's manual, which defines the core functions of Lisp that are known as eval and apply. And so all of Lisp essentially can be defined in terms of eval, apply, and a few other primitives. Alan Kay, who is one of the inventors of the Smalltalk programming language, famously called these Maxwell's equations of software saying that uh, this is the whole world of programming in a few lines that I could put my hand over. So Kay was really fascinated by this idea that something so massive uh, like programming languages could be contained and expressed in, in, in this tiny half a page of, of typeset writing, um, equating it with Maxwell's equations, which do the same thing for physics. I think, I don't know anything about science. So um, at this point, um, I've got Jay Piano's box of records and the notebook in which they've inscribed the perfect programming language. Um, it felt like a puzzle that only I was meant to solve. <clears throat> I had to spend some time piecing all this together uh, and it is by no means a given that I've interpreted all this correctly because I didn't you know, have the benefit of uh, an actual conversation with this person, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but when I started to read the 80 some odd pages of prose, proofs, and programs that comprised Piano's work on the language, it all started to make a little bit more sense to me. Okay, so we're gonna get into the language a little bit. Um, and uh, as I started to study this language, it was clear from the beginning that this was something special, right? This was not uh, like a, the random dashings of a person who had not really thought this through. This was something that Someone had spent a lot of time thinking about it, and I felt really lucky to be the only person on the planet who had ever seen it before, as far as I was concerned. If you Google this, it's not, you won't find it on the internet. Um, so I'm gonna try to spend some time touching on as many parts of this language as I can, and I can confidently say this language is a masterpiece. Um, so we'll start out, I think I have like 15 slides or so, just about these different little points in the language that Piano highlights. Um, so the first part of the notebook covers the mechanized semantics of the language. Um, and to gaze upon this operational semantics in Bacchus-Nauer form uh, seems to be gazing into the very true radiant heart of computation itself. I was very elegant. Uh, you can tell that Piano was heavily influenced by McCarthy's work on Lisp. Uh, the notebook described a very sophisticated type system, one that could express uh, everything from simple types to dependent types using sophisticated algorithms for both type inference and type checking statically. So the idea was, you know, um, capable of helping you out when you're writing your program to tell you which types you were using, helping you determine after the fact if the programs that you wrote were actually uh, well typed in this, under this type system. Um, additionally, uh, the notebook has pages and pages describing a flexible yet reasonable macro system that would let developers produce with libraries what many other languages would require changes to the core runtime to create. Uh, there is a built-in abstraction to query data, allowing business logic of applications to appear simple and declarative. And, and declarativeness, uh, which is an interest of mine in programming languages in general, seemed also to be a particular interest of pianos. Uh, it's an idea that is heavily reinforced throughout the pages. Many of the design decisions seem to come down to whether or not a programmer could write clear, side effect, free, order, independent code in this programming language. Um, additionally, Piano was interested in concurrency. Um, it's an important part of the design of the perfect language. So I just started to call this language like the perfect language, capital P. Um, Piano wanted programmers to be able to write sequential code, analyze resultant programs, and make aspects of them transparently concurrent. So if you had some routine that you wanted to do and then distribute it amongst a number of different cores, taking it from concurrency to parallelism, you would have the ability to do that um, in the perfect language. Uh, and some of the aspects of the language were sur surprising to me because they reminded me of work that some of my colleagues are studying right now. 
Uh, distribution, for example, was handled by a key set of abstractions, a robust scheduler, and the idea that, similarly to concurrency, you should be able to, quote unquote, take regular programs and distribute them at will amongst many hundreds of remote computers something that um, McCarthy and the list people, uh, Carl Hewitt and, the, and et cetera, were interested in the 50s and 60s. That uh, seemed to be a thread uh, that this J Piano was interested in as well. Uh, the perfect language has facilities for object orientation. Uh, there's a tasteful amount of class extending and uh, a concept of objects, um, though it doesn't go too far. Uh, it doesn't manage, it manages to avoid getting mired in the pitfalls of subclassing, which is a really challenging thing. The, the interaction between object-oriented programming and sophisticated type systems is one that keeps programming language researchers very busy, even, even in 2016. Uh, but Piano had a pretty good sense of how he wanted these things to work, he or she, I'm not sure. Um, and so at its core, uh, the language is functional. Um, uh, in fact, to speak of the language's treatment of objects and functions was to finally have a clear, obvious view at where the line sat between the two, if there was one at all. So there's this interesting thing where, you know, if you stare really hard at uh, functions and start to think about, okay, I'm going to take this function, I'm going to augment it with data, and then, you, and then you look at what the definition of an object is, you know, you, you can spend a lot of time uh, kind of driving yourself crazy trying to find the line between those two things. But Piano drew this line uh, in a way that seemed to me to make a lot of sense. And one of the coolest parts of the way that Piano describes perfect regards an idea in the programming language literature known as gradual typing or from scripts to programs, uh, also known as soft types, depending on the paper in question. And this is a really interesting idea. Uh, it's that you could start with a simple script that was dynamic and that did a few things. And over time, you could evolve and enrich the, the program in your language over time with types as your programs, uh, with types as your program's domain concepts solidified. So you could start with, you know, that, that's an argument that uh, people that prefer dynamic programming languages often make, right? I, I don't want to think about types. I just want to, like, write this script. So Piano was interested in allowing you to, like, just write that script. But then if you wanted to come back and turn that script into a program by augmenting it with types that could allow you to statically determine whether or not these programs are written properly, you would be able to do that uh, in a lot of ways. This is truly the best of both worlds. Uh, in terms of dynamic and static typing. Uh, data types, uh, also an interest of mine and uh, something that I find lacking in certain programming languages that I use. Um, available abstractions for describing data types are very flexible and sophisticated and perfect. Uh, he has a uh, concept of GADTs and other union types, some types, things that allow you to take small primitive types, enrich them into more expressive types which pertain to your domain model, things like that. Really, really interesting stuff. Additionally, um, there is pattern matching built in to the syntax in a bunch of different places of the language. This is another favorite language feature of mine. Uh, and the pervasive pattern matching and destructuring allows for concise yet readable code in perfect with little boilerplate. So if you wanted to have a function which accepted a number of different input types, for example, you have this kind of nice equational uh, way of describing these uh, functions that are, is very concise. Um, additionally, data structures. Uh, so, so Piano was not only interested in, in the interface, he was also interested in the implementation. So um, in the runtime system of Perfect, described in a succinct eight pages in the notebook, shows that these data types that I mentioned are backed by very sophisticated data structures, making it very easy to choose the right data structure for the right job. So uh, you would have the ability to use simple um, naive arrays when you wanted to, to use more complex you know, finger trees or something if you needed to do something that was more performative. If you had a good idea of the ratio of reads to writes in your data structures, this language would sort of like guide you in choosing the correct uh, data structures to back. Um, your programs. And, and I, I keep saying this over and over again, but another really cool thing that I'm really interested in that this language has is that it, uh, this big sort of big language that I've been describing has this really nice feature to it, uh, which is that it compiles to a small core language, similar to um, 
you know, Haskell has an um, intermediate language called Hask that all things uh, can compile down to. So similarly, um, I was very enthusiastic to see that this was a central tenet of Perfect. Uh, everything could be compiled down to a small set of instructions, allowing for multiple backends to be created for Perfect should the time come that anyone ever actually used it, right? So a really nice thing about a language that compiles to a small set of instructions is that you can use that instruction set uh, as the starting point to target other languages. So instead of having to say, you know, rewrite all of the different parts of the language in Java, you would just essentially have to implement these core functions and then you would be able to produce code in other programming languages. And we're seeing this a lot now. Very interesting things are happening along these lines in, uh, in OCaml, for example. Um, where uh, it's really easy to target these intermediate languages uh, and generate JavaScript from OCaml code that uh, you know is small and concise and does not contain anything that you don't need. Um, and so, and this small core, another advantage of it um, was that it was part of um, Piano's obsession with portability. So, for whatever reason, uh, Perfect was meant to run on any available architecture. Um, and though I'm far from an expert on low-level computing, I can tell that much care and effort was put into this area of the language's design. So uh, Piano was aware of you know, the idea of multiple architectures and the impact that those things would have on how this language's backend would work. He was interested in being able to target all different types of computers uh, with this programming language. Uh, and, and again, uh, another thing that's cool about this small core uh, is that it also allows for programmers to potentially formally verify programs. Um, so implementations of algorithms, for example, can be proven in perfect uh, if written properly. So there seemed to be this idea that you would have a, an interaction or an interface between this small core backend and, and a theorem prover of some type. And you would be able to kind of move back and forth between those things and say, okay, well, I have this algorithm. It, it purports to uh, you know, conform to these specific invariants. And now I'm going to hook it up to this theorem prover on the backend that's going to show me that, in fact, it does. And then I can use that information going forward and know that um, as opposed to, say, writing a bunch of unit tests to prove that my algorithm was correct, I, I could lean on this uh, formal verification property to help me understand the correctness of my, of my programs. And, and so perhaps most shockingly of all, um, you know, the thing that most programmers seem to care a lot about uh, was not important to Piano at all. Um, so uh, they cared very little about the syntax of the language. Uh, and they state over and over again in the notebook that it really doesn't matter, um, that the small core language is the important component because as far as Piano is concerned, they would, be, they would allow you to, um, this perfect language would allow you to use multiple front ends to target these back ends in a similar way that you could use that intermediate language to generate code in other languages. So like if you could create a compiler from Lisp or JavaScript or Java or Ruby or you know, uh, prologue or whatever it is to this intermediate language, then you would have the ability to write code in this language. And you could essentially then leverage all of these uh, advantages that I've been talking you through. So here's a list um, to summarize. Uh, the notebook covers these points and some more. I just kind of had to choose because there was a lot in there. Um, and so, you know, this is a language that is specified. Um, it has a fancy type system. There's macros. There's data queries. It's declarative when it can be. It's concurrent when you want it to be. It's distributed if you need it to be. It can be both object-oriented and functional. It can be both static and dynamic. It, le it uses a lot of pattern matching. Um, it lets you use destructuring to make your programs uh, you know, read concisely. Um, it has excellent access to data structures. It compiles down to a core language, and it's portable and verifiable. So in a lot of ways, uh, it really does sound like the perfect programming language, one that was very deeply considered. And yes, I found all of this in a notebook, um, and it completely blew me away. Uh, here, here were almost all of the elements that seemed important in programming language design, and they all seemed to me to be the right choices. And so I wanted to ask all of you a question. Uh, you heard me describe this language, right? Uh, and so if you could use this language right now, would you? Uh, raise your hands if you would be interested in trying this language. Okay, cool. 
Mm, I, I don't know. I'm going to say everyone raise their hand just because I'm on video and you're not. Um, <laughs> a few people didn't. Um, so thanks. I'm going to tell you why you should not use it. Um, the number one reason why you shouldn't is because it's not real. Um, uh, much like the languages that Borges uh, critiques in the short story about Wilkins, uh, this language uh, was completely made up by me for the purposes of this talk. Uh, there was no notebook. Uh, there was no box of records. Um, and I still don't have an original copy of that Sun Ra album, um, though I'm going to do some record shopping later today, and maybe I'll find one here in Los Angeles. That would be nice. Um, and so, in other words, uh, the, the quote-unquote perfect with a capital P programming language, it doesn't exist, right? I'm, I was lying to you. I like lying. It's fun. Um, and, and, and also, uh, notably, uh, the perfect with a lowercase p programming language does not exist either, right? Um, and so, the reason why I chose Sun Ra, Borges, and McCarthy to be the connections uh, to this language was because I wanted us to consider this idea of constructed languages. This is a, an idea that has a rich and very interesting history in humanity. For as long as we have been speaking and writing, there have been people who have attempted to create languages artificially which are intended to be better than the languages that we use. Um, and Esperanto is one example of that. It's one that a lot of people have heard of, but it's, you know, and it's probably the most popular of these constructed languages, but there are a lot of other ones that are very interesting that go back. You can find uh, examples from, you know, illuminated manuscripts from the 15th century which describe perfect logical languages like this. And so um, this is a warning for us to heed when we approach programming language design and when we evaluate what languages we use when we write programs. Because you could look back at that celestial emporium of benevolent knowledge that Borges evokes in his story about Wilkins and, and apply the same idea, right, to, to a random person named Jay Piano who's writing uh, the, these tenets of the perfect programming language in a notebook, right? Uh, the kind of thinking that leads us to search for the perfect programming language is the same kind of thinking that might end up classifying all types of programs into 14 arbitrary categories. Um, those concerning numbers with more than 18 words, fast, slow, Fibonacci sequence, easy to reason about, used to transfer money, written by people named Jay, underground, dangerous, confusing, etc. I had to keep that one. Stolen, and that from a long way off looks secure. Uh, and as much as the awesomeness that I described in the perfect language would make for a very cool language, there was a lot missing there, right? There was a lot that was not in that notebook that I made up, right? In fact, none of this was in that notebook that I made up. But uh, any language that doesn't think about these things, about the human side of how programs are written and why they are written, is severely missing the point. So things like errors that are friendly, things like how people are actually going to like write these programs in their editors that they use, package management, libraries, uh, existing programs and idioms, documentation and testing, right? Like all of those gnarly things that are actually what people who write programs spend their time doing. There, there was, there's no mention of this in the idea of a perfect programming language. You would be hard pressed to find someone who would, I think, who would talk about any of these things in the guise of discussing the, the perfect language that they're dying to use. And, th and that's the point. So the way I look at it, uh, we need to completely get this idea out of our heads, that there is some perfect language out there, um, and it's just somehow different than the one that we're using right now. Right? I say the perfect language is the one you're using right now. For all their differences, programming languages and spoken languages do have this in common. They are measured by what they are capable of creating, and even our most maligned languages are capable of creating fabulous, fabulous things. So if we shouldn't be focusing on perfection, what should we focus on? Uh, what can we learn about languages that have been successful? What makes a language successful? The languages do not succeed because they are perfect, right? That's obvious. Uh, I think the existence of this conference, the fact that we're all sitting in this room together, proves, us that, proves to us that uh, beyond perfection, somehow we've been capable of uh, achieving quite a lot. We can try to make our languages perfect, but we will lose something along the way if we do that, and we'll miss something very obvious. 
is, which is that languages succeed because of people. Uh, the people that write and maintain these languages, yes, but mostly us, uh, the people that use these languages to build things. And languages succeed because of the communities that we build and nourish. Uh, all of us in this room right now, for example, uh, we're a community of people that care about software, that want the experience of making software to be better. And languages succeed because of the stuff that we build. Uh, we don't measure the success of our projects based on which languages we use to create them, right? There's that kind of uh, old chestnut about the uh, uh, engineering manager kind of, you know, wagging their finger at the programmer telling them, you know, the customer doesn't care that, you know, yada yada code review or something, right? In, in other words, like when you log on to, not you, but when a normal person that doesn't know how computers work logs on to a website uh, and something works or does not work, they don't care about the language or the technology that was used in the implementation of that. It's just not important. It doesn't matter. And languages succeed because of the tools that we create to support them. Uh, to me, the most exciting advancements in languages recently are those that push the boundaries on how developers actually use them. Right? So you see languages that have been around for a long time, like PHP, JavaScript, Java, Ruby, Python, uh, Clojure is old enough now to sort of be in this list. These languages are not killing themselves to be perfect. And it sometimes drives people crazy that the people that are at the helm of these languages aren't doing what they want them to do with that language, right? Like, how can they not see how much more perfect this language can be, right? You're missing the point if that's what you're spending your time focusing on. So we should recalibrate. Uh, that's the point of this talk. Uh, we should not aim for perfection. Uh, we should not cut down other languages and communities for working on things that we don't care about, right? Uh, it doesn't help if you write a framework and you're talking about how the other framework is more complex than your framework. Let them make their complex framework. When they come up with a good idea, which they inevitably will, you will steal that idea and use it for yourself. And that is how technology works. That's actually how we learn and get better and make things that allow us to do really cool shit like sit in a room in, in a 1920s theater in Los Angeles listening to some moron lie to you. Um, and, and perhaps most importantly, um, you know, like I said, let's care about what other people are working on and steal liberally uh, and let's all listen to more Sun Ra, read more Borges and study more McCarthy. So thank you for listening to my story. Uh, sorry for the bait and switch. I hope it was worth it. Thank you very much.